Hello, good evening and welcome to News 360. We are live from the News Hub at Odessa Kanda. I'm Natalie Fort. And my name is Alfred Okonse. Coming up in the bulletin tonight. News 360 headlines is brought to you by... Judgment in the maritime boundary dispute between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire to be delivered on September 23. Funds for the commencement of the free senior high school program to be released by close of the week. Also, some Togolese residents in Ghana protest the 50-year rule of the nursing days. And on the foreign front, Joa Lorenko declared winner of Angola's presidential election. stories for you plus the very latest from the world of sports and entertainment here on news 360 you're streaming live all across the world on 3news.com and tv3 ghana on facebook so our first story this evening the international tribunal for the law of the sea will deliver its judgment in the maritime boundary dispute between ghana and cote d'ivoire on september 23 the two countries have laid claim to the disputed boundary in the atlantic ocean and are both calling on the special chamber to deliver judgment in their favor. Cote d'Ivoire is praying the tribunal to declare that Ghana had moved into its maritime boundary, but Ghana, on the other hand, led by the Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Gloria Kufu, has requested the tribunal to reject Cote d'Ivoire's claims and maintain the status quo, which had been respected by both countries for more than four decades. In February 27, 2015, Cote d'Ivoire submitted a request for the prescription of provisional measures under Article 290, Paragraph 1 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, requesting the Chamber to order that Ghana shall, inter alia, take all steps to suspend all oil exploration and exploitation operations underway in the disputed area. In the release date of September 6, the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea indicated Judgment is expected to be read by President of the Special Chamber at 11 a.m. on Saturday, September 23. And in education, while some prospective senior high school students are still struggling to get placed, others and their parents have begun checking on admissions at the various schools. Evelyn Tingma reports parents and their wards have, however, been asked by school authorities to report on Monday, September 10. 17-2018 Senior High School academic calendar is scheduled to begin next Monday with the rolling out of the freeze SHS policy, but efforts to ascertain whether school authorities have received the required materials and funds for the free senior high education were unsuccessful. We were told heads of government and assisted senior high schools nationwide were in a meeting. Some parents were at the schools to check on their ward's admission. I'm here to confirm my sister's placement into Accra Girls. Yeah, they're saying that the list from Ghana Education Service isn't here yet. Even though the placement is online, they don't have the list to verify that she has been placed here or not. So we should go back and come back by Monday. Maybe they will have the list. The first choice was uh, Presec Boys. The second choice was here. Uh, he got it. So we just came to check on the admissions. That we should come on Monday. That the headmasters are in a meeting, therefore, every student should come on Monday. Meanwhile, all prospective SHS students have up to Thursday, September 7, to be placed. Meanwhile, the Deputy Minister in charge of pre tertiary education, Dr. Yao Se Iduchum, has given the assurance funds for the commencement of the program will be released by the close of the week. He was addressing the 55th National Conference of Heads of Assisted Secondary Schools in Ho. We'll bring you the details of this particular story now as we speak. The minister is giving that particular assurance uh, that they, their funds will be released to them before Monday.
I'm going to get to, as we go on into the bulletin this evening, but the Registrar, the National Scholarship Secretariat, Kingsley Ajiman, has revealed feeding grants for senior high schools under the Northern Scholarship will from the 2017-2018 academic year be paid through electronic platforms. The e-platform will apply to all public senior high schools as government commences its flagship free education policy. Payment of feeding grants of senior high schools in the three regions of the North have been fraught with difficulties in the last two academic years. Payment of feeding grants of senior high schools in the three regions of the North. Although government has initiated steps to pay the backlog owed schools, heads of senior high schools have had to travel to Accra, a situation the head teachers say results in delays in payment. However, the registrar at the National Scholarship Secretariat, Kingsley Ajabine, is optimistic under the free senior high school policy. All such challenges with regards to payment will be ruled out. A new system of payment which, which will ensure the transfer of funds directly into the account of schools has been introduced. This will, this will not only eliminate cost and the high risk of traveling to Accra to collect checks, but also more importantly, and short prompt payment of scholarship schemes. He allayed the fears of teachers and parents about the buffer stock program, which allows heads to purchase consumables for the schools. Over 50,000 students have benefited from the Northern Scholarship, which was instituted in 1965 to afford students from the three regions of the North access to education. Away from education, some Togolese residents in Ghana Wednesday morning, this morning, protested against the 50-year rule of the Nassim Bays. The International Desk filed the following report. Here at Kawukudi in Accra, many Togolese residing in Ghana are protesting against the 50-year rule of Ford and Nasingbe. They're also calling for a return of the 1992 constitution, which allows for multi-party democracy. They say that the development of Togo has been stifled by the 50-year rule of the Nasingbe's. <laughs> The protest by Togolese nationals residing in Ghana coincided with others held in Lome, the capital of Togo, as well as in Lagos, Nigeria. The protesters are calling for the stepping down of President Fouare Nasingbe, who has been in power since 2005. He was appointed by his father, President Nasingbe Eyadema, as Minister of Equipment, Mines, Post and Telecommunications, serving from 2003 to 2005. Following President Ayadema's death in 2005, Nasingbe was immediately made president with support from the army. Doubts have been raised regarding the constitutional legitimacy of the succession, leading to heavy regional pressure being placed on Nasingbe. In 2002, the former president Nasingbe Ayadema, seeing the gravity of his health, decided you know, to have his own son to inherit him. So he decided to have a meeting with his uh, parliamentarians and they cooked 2002 constitution, which there are articles that favors them. We, we didn't know him in the political you know, atmosphere. His father brought him from abroad and instantly he was a minister. When his father died, less than 48 hours, they changed the constitution of the 1992. He moved from minister to a parliamentarian. From the parliamentarian, automatically he moved to the speaker of the parliament. So he took power by force. We need to change. So they are trying to still be on power, which is not favoring us. Head of the Togolese diaspora community in Ghana, Max Kojo, is calling on the increased support of Ghana and other neighboring countries, as well as regional bodies, in getting foreign Asingbe to step down. In Togo, thousands of women poured on the streets to demand the immediate resignation of President Fouare Nasingbe. The women, some of whom went topless, have been calling for an end to the 50-year rule of the Nasingbe dynasty after Fouare's father, Eyadema, ruled that country for 38 years before his death in 2005. The protesters regret the slow pace of development under the Nasingbe's 50-year rule calling for urgent intervention to maintain peace and stability in Togo and the sub-region. 
Well, so the Nyasingbe family has been in power since 1967 when Yadema took over power through a coup. Let's take a look at some facts about the Nyasingbe family and the dynasty in Togo for the past almost 50 years. Hello, good evening and welcome to News 360. We are live from the News Hub at Adesaway, Kanda. I'm Natalie Fort. And my name is Alfred Okonse, coming up in the bulletin tonight. News 360 headlines is brought to you by... Judgment in the maritime boundary dispute between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire to be delivered on September 23. Funds for the commencement of the free senior high school program to be released by close of the week. Also, some Togolese residents in Ghana protest the 50-year rule of the nursing days. And on the foreign front, Joa Lorenko declared winner of Angola's presidential election. stories for you plus the very latest from the world of sports and entertainment here on news 360 you're streaming live all across the world on 3news.com and tv3 ghana on facebook so our first story this evening the international tribunal for the law of the sea will deliver its judgment in the maritime boundary dispute between ghana and Cote d'ivoire on september 23 the two countries have laid claim to the disputed boundary in the atlantic ocean and are both calling on the special chamber to deliver judgment in their favor. Cote d'Ivoire is praying the tribunal to declare that Ghana had moved into its maritime boundary, but Ghana, on the other hand, led by the Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Gloria Kufu, has requested the tribunal to reject Cote d'Ivoire's claims and maintain the status quo, which had been respected by both countries for more than four decades. In February 27, 2015, Cote d'Ivoire submitted a request for the prescription of provisional measures under Article 290, Paragraph 1 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, requesting the Chamber to order that Ghana shall, inter alia, take all steps to suspend all oil exploration and exploitation operations. Able to accommodate such uh, voices, such opposing voices, in such a manner that will actually even uh, provide the basis to assess the acceptability or otherwise of the government. And I think that is what should, should be the case. Well, but uh, is it really time for the sub-regional body to step in beyond just a, a diplomatic intervention? Because what we do know, ECOWAS chair, uh, Foyna Singwe, is having his country in this situation. Many have argued that the internal security has to break down before the sub-regional body can make an intervention. Do you subscribe to this? No, I think that uh, part of the ECOWAS uh, uh, conflict prevention framework is about using preventive diplomacy to even ensure that such breakdown of law and order does not occur. So in our opinion, and we have, uh, we have actually issued a statement to this effect, ECOWAS should stick up at this moment and actually even use peer pressure on the president of Togo to ensure that these opposing voices are accommodated as much as the supporting voices are accommodated. That is the beauty of democracy. And we are concerned that the Commission is also not uh, stepping up uh, 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 on this matter because, uh, in our opinion, probably because the chair of the authority is also um, the, the president of uh, uh, Togo. Well, but, but how does his position compromise uh, the the sub-regional body, I mean the commission and not the authority? No, the authority cannot be compromised because uh, uh, President Fonya Simbe is just one member. But the commission probably might have challenges in terms of the kind of statement it can issue if it's going to the chair of the authority. You know, so the, 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 the staff of the commission are employees of the, the, the authority of heads of state and government. And that for us is, is a serious concern. Well, some have said that the protests don't seem to be coordinated. I mean, such protests as we've seen in other countries, that brings the needed change or the expected change 
or response from government is more coordinated. This we see only limited to Lome and uh, some scattered areas and then here in Ghana as well. Do you see the rather scattered protest bringing the kind of change they want? One is not in a position to advise on the kind of change that the people of Togo want. Our concern is that whether those who are supporting or whether those who are opposing, everybody should be given equal opportunity, provided the needed security, to be able to demonstrate either their support or their frustration. How the Togolese want the future of their country to be is entirely in their hands. So it's not our position to say whether they are coordinated or not. You know, the, 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 the future of Togo is as envisioned by the citizens of Togo. I thank you very much. Good evening to you. Thank you. That's uh, Chukwe Meka. Is a, he is the executive director of the West African Network for Peace Building. One up now. Away from that, President Ekofuado has received letters of credence from envoys of Zambia and Norway at the Flagstaff House. The president pledged Ghana's commitment at working to strengthen the ties on trade, agriculture and commerce with the two countries. Zambian High Commissioner Raymond Mbulu was the first to present his letters of credence. The engineer, trained diplomat, pledged to do his best to strengthen relations between the two countries. Zambia will have a great deal to learn from the Republic of Ghana in terms of uh, mineral beneficiation and also the areas of taxation in which we have done so well, Your Excellency, as a Republic. In agriculture, Your Excellency, we are equally aware that Ghana has done very well especially in the field of research, the field of uh, value addition, uh, the value chain in terms of cassava. Cassava is produced in, in my country. So I want to draw as many lessons as we can practically do from this great republic. What both of us are required to do is to make sure that the Ghana-Zambian relationship is strengthened during the period. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, there were one or two matters of history that uh, I raised with the president when I was there. You know about this lingering issue about our teachers who have been there. When I got there, he had made efforts to try and see about resolving their problems. Sure. And I think some initial payments have in fact been made in settlement of their entitlements. But it's a matter which I'll be grateful if you could also, from your end, add your voice so that it can, a resolution can be expedited. Next to present his letters was the Norwegian ambassador Gunnar Andreas Holm. He assured the president he will use his four-year stay to strengthen relations between the two countries. Ghana's vibrant economy and your rich natural resources as well as your highly educated human resources, this creates a unique uh, basis for further growth and development of this country. And we are very happy that we are in partnership with you in that process. We are moving beyond aid in line with uh, your government's policy. I think there are over 40 Norwegian companies now uh, present and, and working and engaged in, in Ghana, with many of them in joint ventures with Ghanaian partners. President Ikufado said Ghana will learn from Norway's effective management of its petroleum resources. We have been particularly inspired by that model have already had concrete demonstrations of its value for us. The oil for development fund that you spoke about has been of major assistance to us in developing capacity and trying to set the framework for the management of our own resources. We are now a modest oil producing nation, but we are at the stage whereby we can use it positively if we adopt a culture of best practices or we can also go off on a tangent in the way in which others unfortunately have done and I think our association with you is something that uh, will definitely assist us. In some other news this evening, there was a tussle between some fisher folks and the member of parliament of Shama constituency in the western region over the inauguration of some landing beach premix committees. The protest by the aggrieved group was over the inclusion of certain names on the list, resulting in the arrest and detention of one woman.
This is the second attempt to inaugurate the premix committee for Shama. The first on June 30 was abandoned following the alleged inclusion of some persons considered unqualified to be members. In the latest attempt, some people argued that some names on the list were people who had no knowledge in fishing and related activities. The fisher folk accused the district chief executive, Joseph Amua, and the member of parliament for Shama, Atu Pamford, for being the cause of the confusion. The aggrieved fisher folk were later ordered out of the Shamar District Education Hall by the police to pave way for the inauguration. One protester, Florence Ahuchi, was arrested and detained. Earlier, the sector minister, Elizabeth Na Afulikwe, used the occasion to remind the fisher folk of the consequences of illegal fishing practices. We are not just finding people and allowing them to go back there to go and continue doing illegal fishing. But we are going to also take away licenses. Yes. Now we do that quarterly. So by the end of September, it is expected that we are going to take away some licenses. She assured them of effort to stop trawlers from operating in areas reserved for canoe fishing. Well, away from the tussle in Chama, uh, we come to the greater crowd because the member of parliament for Tema West, Carlos Ahinkra, has been suspended by the Tema Metropolitan Assembly for six months from any assembly activities. His suspension follows his alleged attack on a TMA engineer who was supervising the demolition of unauthorized structures erected on the shoulders of the road around the Coco village. The Tema Metropolitan Assembly had ordered the engineer to pull down the structure because they were reported to be an obstacle to the construction work for the cocoa board in Tema Community 2. The Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry and Member of Parliament for Tema West stormed the place where the demolition was going on on August 31 and allegedly attacked and prevented the engineer and workers from undertaking the exercise. The MP's action led the Public Relations and Complaints Committee of the TMA under the chairmanship of the presiding member, Richard Fiadomo, to suspend him from the assembly. The action was after the Coco Village traders protested against the demolition exercise on Monday, September 4. The statement issued by the Ghana Journalist Association cautioning the media to refrain from destroying local entrepreneurs and businesses in the name of investigative journalism continues to receive flack. Many are questioning the commitment of the association to promoting the welfare of journalists and the interest to expose rot in the public sector. The following is a news desk report. Apart from the social media backlash of the statement by the GG, the Media Foundation for West Africa has also issued a statement cautioning the association against what it describes as attempts to undermine investigative and anti-corruption journalism in the country. The Media Foundation for West Africa in this statement expresses shock at the GGA for giving such a directive especially when it failed to provide references to any example that called for the caution. It questions the GJ on the basis of the release who has been tried and pronounced guilty in and by the media, among many other questions. Anti-corruption civil society has also issued a statement disagreeing with the Ghana Journalists Association. It expresses deep disappointment over the statement signed by its president, Afil Moni. The statement says GGA may knowingly and unknowingly be playing along with businesses which may be involved in allegations of wrongdoing and want to undermine the work of investigative journalists who are exposing alleged wrongdoing. The Dean of the School of Information and Communication Studies at the University of Ghana, Professor Audrey Gajapo, also has registered her displeasure about the GGA statement. She says the association has a primary duty to its constituent rather than championing local businesses in the country. A question many journalists are asking is whether the GGA is fighting for the interests of its members or promoting the interests of non-members. Well, <laughs> the least so, said, yeah. I mean, we, yeah, we need to go for a quick break. <laughs> so live on News 6 we've got the very latest from the world of business for you shortly. Stay with us.
you watch a news 360 thanks for staying with us let's do some business now my name is Manikia Mensa Brampa now the vice president dr. Mahamudu Baumia has underscored the need for transparency and business facilitation to encourage private sector investment in accelerating the pace of the country's development he made the observation at the opening of the G20 compact with Africa meeting in Accra G20 compact with Africa CWA, endorsed by the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors in March 2017, was initiated by the German presidency in the finance track. The aim is to develop comprehensive, coordinated and country-specific investment compact between individual African countries with the African Development Bank, IMF and World Bank Group and other partners. It is also geared towards promoting private investment in Africa, particularly in infrastructure, agriculture and agro-processing. The initiative is based on mutual commitment to measures and instruments to improve the framework conditions for private investment. The first seven African countries to express interest in individual investment compact are Cote d'Ivoire, Ethiopia, Ghana, Morocco, Rwanda, Senegal and Tunisia. At the opening of the G20 compact with Africa in Accra, Vice President Dr. Mohamed Dubaumia said government has identified and is implementing reform programs to accelerate the pace of the country's development. We are focused on prudent expenditure management to reduce expenditure, broadening the tax base, enhancing tax compliance to reverse the unfavorable debt dynamics. We are reducing government dominance in the domestic debt market and promoting corporate issuance. Africa needs $340 billion to bridge its infrastructure gap. The vice president noted driving the G20 compact will be one of the means to solve the infrastructure deficit. Aid flows from traditional donors are dwindling across Africa. That we must begin to contemplate a future beyond aid and also a future with enhanced productive capacity with a robust private sector, one where our infrastructure gaps are met. On the continent, the finance minister Ken Ufuriata endorsed the creating of a supportive business environment for the private sector to thrive. He is confident the compact will improve the macro, business and financing frameworks of participating African countries. CWA's focus on better fiscal management and increasing private sector investment therefore fully aligns with our own agenda that prioritize these objectives. The initiative is demand-driven and open to all African countries. Right, now let's look at the health aspect of business and the consumption of alcohol during pregnancy has been scientifically proven to cause some irreparable damage to the unborn child as well as the expecting mother. Well, in commemoration of this year's Fatal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Awareness Day, Accra Brewery Limited ABL has partnered with the police hospital in Accra to conscientize pregnant women on the threats alcohol consumption can cause. Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders, FASDs, refer to a group of conditions that can occur in a person whose mother drank alcohol during pregnancy. Annually, September 9 marks International FASD Awareness Day. The month and day were selected to highlight the nine months of pregnancy, a time within which it is imperative that women abstain from drinking alcohol. Over the last four years, ABL has been at the forefront of championing the cause with its alcohol and pregnancy advocacy program. This year's program saw scores of prospective and pregnant women undergo a crash course on the dangers associated with the consumption of alcohol during pregnancy. Marufatu Esi Prima, is the director of nursing and midwifery services at the police hospital. When they go home, Obi, uh, some of them, they take alcohol before they sleep. They take alcohol before they eat. We have advised them against that. That yes, you don't have appetite, but the medication that you are giving you is sufficient. It's a stimulant, it's appetizer, but at the end, it becomes a depressant. You can even go into stupor and even die. 
Fetal alcohol syndrome is one of the biggest causes of non-genetic mental handicap in fetuses and the only one that is 100% preventable. Marufatu Brahma also pointed out the role that men play in FASDs and called on potential fathers to be mindful of their alcohol intake. If a man gets intoxicated, research has shown that when the alcohol goes into the bloodstream, it affects the sperm. So the defect sperm, when fertilizes the egg, it gives abnormal fetus. Director of Corporate and Legal Affairs of ABL, Ajoba Chiamu, reiterated her outfit's commitment to promoting smart drinking and making every experience with alcohol a positive one. We want to see the business survive for another 86 years. And so we believe that as part of our better world agenda, we create a healthier world where people drink responsibly for those who are able to drink and so that our business can continue to grow. Across major health facilities in the country, the alcohol and pregnancy program has so far impacted the lives of over 3,000 women in Ghana. ABL has since 1931 produced major brands such as Club Beer, Castle Milk Stout, Stone Lager, Muscatella, Club Orange, Club Cola, among others. Right, so while some students are waiting to be placed in the various senior high schools, traders of trunks and chop boxes as well as stationery in Accra are optimistic sales will pick up once placement for senior high schools is completed. For now, they say business is not encouraging. A trunk, chop box, mattress and a pillow are a few of the items required by every border in a second cycle institution. For traders, this is a peak season, but for sales, it is yet to pick up for these items. Senior high school entrance for academic year 2017-2018 are expected to go to school for free, but definitely when it comes to provisions, definitely that wouldn't be free for them. Talking about the sale of chop boxes and trunks as well as stationery, we're stationed here uh, exactly where these things are for sale in the central business district. Activity is brisk here. Talking about stationery coming in from the various depots into the market for sale. We, we've had some students as well as parents come to buy some of the items. Talking about trunks. You see names being embossed on trunks as well as some chop boxes. And uh, when it comes to pricing, you can get a chop box for as much as 80 Ghana cities and for the trunks it ranges between 100 Ghana cities 150 and 200 depending on your bargaining power so how are the price ranges like comparing it to last academic year and this year oh okay from last year it was about around 65 to 70 but this year is around 80 to 150 actually the prices of the wood has changed drastically so we are not getting the same price as it was uh, last year. At least you can bring about 50 boxes a day and it will be, maybe you can sell about 30 or 40 boxes a day. I went to Fantaman uh, this morning. I was told that the minister had not sent the list to the rural schools, secondary schools. But I believe that the basic things we need for the child to go to school is what I have to get. So that's why I'm here to buy. It is also the beginning of the academic year for basic school pupils who would also require some basic items including stationery but traders lamented on the low patronage of their goods. You can come here to the central business district, you get anything you want but of course you must have a strong bargaining power. My name is Nanekia Mensah Vampa reporting for TV3 News. Right and there's more news on our website, it's 3news.com. News 360 continues after this. Stay with us. Good evening. All right, so if you're just tuning in, then you're just in time for the sports news right here on News 360. My name is Thierry Nyan. Let's get started. What moment could see up here was a clueless, tactically bankrupt coach. A few days later, he is being hailed as a man who knows his stuff, but uh, what meanings uh, can be drawn from two games against Congo that exclusively, uh, you know, bend Ghana's World Cup hopes? 
The Ghana coach has seen his stock fall and rise again over the last two Ghana games against Congo and that could provide vital clues to the direction the Black Stars need to take for the future. The 1-1 draw against Congo in Kumasi last Friday was followed by a 5-1 win away in Brazzaville. Ghana's hopes of a fourth straight World Cup may have taken serious body blows over the last international break and it may have inadvertently worked magic for Apia's long-term team-building efforts for the 2019 Nations Cup and beyond, according to sports journalist Sadiq Adams. It's a statement for him. It's a very good win. It's a good revival for the Black Stars, despite the fact that they might not qualify for the World Cup. But this will be the basis for Kosi Apia to draw the mark and be, I mean, very, very courageous in selecting players who are hungrier with a desire to play for the team instead of the big names who come and offer nothing to the team. For all the criticism, Apia's record in competitive games has been good. In three competitive games since he returned to the Ghana job, Apia's team has won two, scored 11 and drawn one. Ex-international Abukari Damba says the manner of the wins provided the clearest evidence to Apia that it is time to alter the composition of his team. The players who were given the opportunity were very desirous to play and they really played with urgency. So we had to do without some key players in our, uh, our team and the younger ones were able to showcase and hold their heads high. So in this particular game, they did what they were supposed to do. But that is not to say it is the end of it all or we have arrived. If he misses this opportunity, every game might feel like Ghana versus Congo in Kumase when what we saw in Brazzaville and in June against Ethiopia is possible on a regular basis. Now the World Cup qualifiers continue to provide incredible drama in Africa after two rounds of matches over the last one week. But there is still no definite qualifier from the continent. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. When you look at the various groups, uh, when, you, uh, you know, if, when it comes to the 2018 World Cup qualifiers, it is just about the kind of uh, information that you would need when, it looks at, when you look at the qualifiers. The likes of Tunisia and Nigeria have 10 points respectively in their groups, meaning that there is definitely going to be a struggle for the remainder. So Nigeria would have to wait for the last round of uh, you know, game to determine who is going to be in there. But in Group E, Egypt are back in control of uh, Group E after they made up for their preparations in that particular one. Now Tunisia and Burkina Faso both came back to earn hard-fought 2-2 draws late on against Congo DR and Senegal respectively. Elsewhere, those results mean there is still everything to play for on the continent in a race to Russia, but other teams are out. Cameroon's draw with Nigeria means they are no longer in the running for a qualifying spot, as is Algeria, who lost at home to Zambia. Now, when you look at the Black Stars itself, Ghana are also now in great danger of missing out despite resounding victory over Congo. All right, so how is it that one football, football association decides to criticize teams in another football association? It's happening in Europe. La Liga president Javier Tebas has accused clubs such as Manchester City and Paris Saint-Germain of laughing at football's financial fair play, FFP rules. Now referring to the French club's £200 million signing of Barcelona star Neymar, Tebas said, we've caught uh, PSG peeing in the swimming pool and Neymar is a peeing off the diving board. The 55-year-old who has uh, run La Liga since 2013 explained he has no problem with Abu Dhabi, Qatar or any other state deciding it wants to buy a football club as long as they play fair and buy the rules. They've agreed sponsorships which are not based on market rates. PSG earns uh, more from sponsorships than Manchester United does, and that's impossible. That's financial doping, and it's uh, destroying the industry. All right, so the man's problems are very simple. He doesn't understand why some states buy certain clubs, buy certain players with outrageous amounts of money and then ruin, uh, you know, the remainder of European football markets. But that's exactly how we bring an end to the sports bulletin. My name is Thierry Man. I'll see you some other time.
Welcome back to News 360. Let's take a look at what's making news on the international front now. The results of Angola's general election have been announced. The ruling MPLA secured 61.0% of vote with 150 MPs. Junita had 26.67% with 51 MPs, whilst Casa CE polled 9.44% with 16 MPs. The remainder of the vote went to smaller parties. Jao Lorenzo will be inaugurated as the country's first new president since 1979 on 25th September. The UN says cholera is spreading rapidly through camps sheltering people displaced by an Islamist insurgency in northeastern Nigeria. According to the UN, more than 530 suspected cases had been registered in camps in Bono State, three times the number reported five days earlier. More than 20 people have died. Nearly 2 million people have been displaced by the conflict between Boko Haram militant and government forces. And we've got more international news on our website, 3news.com. Bring you more news shortly. Stay with us. Remember Che Wa Part 1 to 11. It's one of those many popular tales that endeared the Akan based movie industry, popularly known as Kumawood. To Ghanaians. But have you had any idea who the script writer of the Danfobie production movie is? Well, trust those who are right to get anyone talking. He caught up with the man. Chewa, a superstitious based Ghanaian movie, was the talk of town in the mid 2000s. Celebrated Kumawood actress Rose Mensa got the name Chewa following the success of the movie. Meet 78 year old Guy Boache, actor and script writer for Chewa Part 1 to 11. Guy Boache, as he is affectionately called, contributed many sought after stories to several Kumawood producers, particularly Danfobie. I have scripted several top rated movies. Before going into script writing, I was the drama director for the AB Crencil Drama Group. He lamented over poor remuneration. I was paid peanuts for my script. I earned 100 CDs for each movie I scripted. The 78-year-old disclosed he earned very little to cater for his kids, forcing him to live from hand to mouth. I'm now into Loto forecasting. I'm the caretaker for the building I currently reside in. I regret not being able to put up a house despite my fame. He still has exciting and insightful stories to share and is willing to work with film producers. The veteran writer encouraged the current crop of actors and script writers to consider investing during their peak. Uh,
That's a sad one there by Usu Barai. Clearly shows the level of importance taken on scripting in the local film industry. Well, on to Nollywood. Celebrated actress Eukarya Anunobi on Tuesday, September 5, laid her son Raymond Eku to rest. Raymond Eku, 15, passed away on Tuesday, August 22, after suffering from complications associated with sickle cell anemia. Eukarya's colleague actors, including Mona Lisa Koka, Ini Edo, Rita Dominic, and other celebrities, attended the burial. Unbubbly young man, I and mean, his soul yeah, continued to rest in perfect peace. But on behalf of the rest of the team, thank you for watching Hatsi on News 360. My name is Alfred Akanti. And I'm Natalie Fort. We've got more news on our website, 3news.com. Remember, News at 10 will simulcast on our sister station, 3FM 92.7. Next is Tashan. Enjoy your evening.